We'll go on to our, uh, our next phase of um, the fire department history. Uh, it's a big phase, it's the Fire Prevention Bureau and um, how it started here in Kankakee and who started it. We're, we're blessed to have the person who actually started it here and started that, uh, uh, that division. Um, if you notice, there's some artifacts, I would call them, that are laying out here. Uh, some of them, will, they'll talk about some of the stuff that's laid out here um, during their presentation, so please feel free to take a look at that. Uh, uh, Ron's book is there, The History of the Kankakee Fire Department, that he, uh, he wrote, and he also wrote a book that includes all the fire chiefs through the history of the Kankakee Fire Department. And the next book is gonna be the assistant chiefs and then the captains and then... Um, we also have a, a nice little library that we put together with all of our, all the vehicles and um, the, their, almost their specs and pictures of them that we're gonna put that in also into another uh, binder book like we have there. But we have to get all those pictures together. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Richard Gimo. He's married uh, to his wife, Ruth, for 66 years. Uh, they have one son, Richard, is born and raised in Kankakee. Joined the fire department July 7th, 1957, some 56 years ago. Uh, Richard moved up through the ranks as a firefighter, aerial operator, fire inspector, uh, and assistant chief. He retired January 1979 after 21 and a half years of service. 1971, uh, he was awarded the Fireman of the Year by the Kankakee JCs in recognition for outstanding service to the community. And then again, in 1978, he was awarded uh, Fireman of the Year by the Hunter Club of uh, Kankakee County for community service. Uh, he was one of our uh, personnel that responded to Crescent City, June 22, 1970. And he received special award from uh, John Marcourt, he's very proud of this, uh, for rescuing a 14-year-old boy from the Kankakee River in 1969 around the Legion Park behind the old Kanky City swimming pool. In retirement, uh, Richard and his wife, they love to travel, pulling an RV vehicle and uh, around the USA, Canada, and Mexico, and they spent 30 winters down in uh, Clearwater, St. Petersburg area in Florida. He is proud of three little fire department records that he created. But anyway, he's the oldest living retiree of the Kanky Fire Department, age 89, years young next month. He's also been retired uh, for 35 years uh, this January, which is the longest of any retiree with us. He's also the uh, last living retiree who was a veteran of World War II. Trained as an infantryman with uh, two Purple Hearts, a Bronze Star for his action in Anzio. He was the fire department's first fire inspector. And he's here today to discuss the beginning of the Office of Fire Inspector and the Fire Prevention Bureau and their activities. Chief Kimo. I got a Good mic. Afternoon. One moment. I got a, I got a mic up. up. This, uh, what I'm doing here is I'm micing him up for the video, which we're gonna produce a DVD of this program that will be available uh, to anyone who wants it. Oh, thank you. And good afternoon again. On behalf of Ron Humberg and Tom McVeigh and myself, I wish to thank a museum director for inviting us here today, and also Roberta Renville, who's on the board of the museum, to, who thought up about this program about the history of the Kanky Fire Department. I also want to thank the chief for asking me to present the, this presentation and my activity in the Fire Prevention Bureau 52 years ago. I'm not going to go back as far as Rod did. <laughs> I'm going back only 52 years. And last person I want to thank we couldn't put this program on without him, except we'd be a lot of talking on those slides, but Dave Harmon spent weeks and hours getting our three programs on PowerPoint. Thank you, Dave. I'll take some questions if someone has them after the presentation. I'm gonna discuss a very short history on my starting on the fire department. 
prior to getting into inspections. I started on the July 11, 1957, the day the so-called 100-year flood hit Kankakee. The shifts were then 24 out and 24 off. Well, the first day I stayed 72 hours. They didn't let me go home. <laughs> My first shift commander was acting Captain Louis Hamburg, Ron Hamburg's father. He was on, I was on his, his shift for some time. Later, I was transferred to a shift under Captain John Marquardt and became one of the first drivers and operators of the new 58 aerial. That's my short history of the, my entry in the fire department four years before the appointment as fire inspector. Mayor Ray Nury appointed John Morkport as acting fire chief to replace James P. Barnell in 1958. Barnell was attending the grand opening of the Chicago Fire Academy the day he got fired. <laughs> he come back, he didn't have a job. In August 21st of 1961, Chief Markport submitted to the city council a post of fire inspector. It was denied because it, it wasn't included in the budget to hire a rookie at $350 a month to replace the inspector's position. Well, Chief didn't give up. On September 6th of 1961, he resubmitted the request for the post of fire inspector. After several council meetings, the ordinance was created the, for the post of fire inspector on October 16, 1961, 52 years next month. The next day, October 17th, Chief Markward appointed yours truly to the post of fire inspector. Uh, working days instead of a, sh a shift. <laughs> Lieutenants made $25 more than a firefighter back there. You guys remember that. <laughs> and the captains made $50 more than a first class firefighter in those days. So the chief made my salary in between the lieutenants and the captain at $40 a month increased over a firefighter. Another thing, he ordered me, and I mean he ordered me, to wear a white shirt and cap, which is a no-no unless you've been promoted by the police and fire commission. There was a lot of static, including my brother-in-law who was a lieutenant on the fire department <laughs> about this. Now prior to the position of fire inspector, Inspections were done once a year in October during the National Fire Prevention Week by on and off duty firefighters. We conducted normally the, the fire drills, school fire drills, and they expected the downtown business area. Now, hospitals, industrial buildings, gas stations, schools, and other categories of buildings were not inspected in this short time of, of a week. If any complaints came in during the year, the fire chief handled that. And there was no follow-up or paperwork on it. Uh, the title of fire chief, or a captain, lieutenant, or fire officer, or firefighter, uh, issued verbal orders, which was necessary in some cases. No one challenged it our so-called authority, even though we didn't have an ordinance to enforce it. Yours truly started uh, with a folding card table and a folding chair with an old underwood typewriter in the shift commander's office, which was converted to the former fire chief's office at number one fire station. I had a lot to learn about the position of fire inspector besides looking for overloaded electrical cords or long drop cords or outdated fire extinguishers. Had no budget because it was in October and the new budget didn't come up till May. So no filing cabinet, no supplies for six months. 
till the new fiscal year came up, kind of working on a shoestring. Uh, during uh, the next month in, in 61, uh, visited several cities that had fire prevention bureaus. Aurora, Elgin, Chicago Heights, and even Hammond, Indiana. They had active bureaus. Went out with inspections with them. And studied their records and re-inspections and type of forms they used. Now the fire inspector duties included inspections of schools, office buildings, factories, apartment buildings, hotels, churches, nursing homes, gasoline stations, public assembly buildings, restaurants, and taverns. It's a lot of categories and each one has a different problem because of their occupancy. <clears throat> I checked the building for internal fire protection, like sprinklers, standpipes, or exit doors, see that they swing outward. So a lot of learning had to be done and learn what real fire prevention and inspection was all about. None of the seven existing hotels had a fire alarm system. Conditions of outside fire escapes in hotels, schools, and public assembly buildings were badly in need of attention. The city was in very poor shape in regards to meeting fire codes and fire prevention practices at that time. I think one of the reasons why there was stubbornness or lack of cooperation in getting the post of fire inspector in the ordinances, the aldermen were very apprehensive about this new post of fire inspector. The firemen, I'm using the word loosely, that's what we called ourselves in the 60s and 70s instead of a firefighter. <coughs> to give this person all this power and authority, would, we, would he be coming down hard on the community? It was a slow first couple of years. It was a selling job. Didn't have any ordinances to enforce it to begin with, except the state fire marshals. <clears throat> so it was a selling job to enforce the inspections. Now fire inspection was something very new to the community and the general public. No more walkthroughs through once a year through a designated week. The public and business community were very cooperative. My aim was to help people stay in business through better fire prevention and pointing out, explaining why certain things were a fire hazard. This is Mrs. Santos, Chief Mark Ford and yours truly. On March 1964, the Santos Hotel 109 East Court a two-story, 24-room hotel installed the first hotel fire alarm system in Kankakee. At this time, two other hotels were in the process of installing alarm systems. In 1965, I received additional help. This is uh, four years after I was appointed. Al May started part-time bases on every third duty day doing inspections nine to five with me and then back to his shift at five o'clock. He became on full-time basis October 3rd, 1965. He was given the rank of assistant fire inspector by the fire chief. We moved upstairs, lack of a space downstairs, we moved upstairs to larger quarters in room 210, just outside the council chambers. All typing and re-inspections was done using carbon paper, correct the type. We had no clerk typist, one typewriter, no copy machine or computers in those days. As I said earlier, Alan and myself were appointed fire inspector and assistant fire inspector by the chief. In March 1966, Al and I requested a chief to take a police and fire commission exam. 
and he agreed to it. He consented, and we both passed and made the job a little bit more secure for us. We had 11 nursing and shelter care homes, nine of them are two-story wood frame construction. It's a big concern about safety of the patients in these buildings. Instructions were given in fire evacuations and basic knowledge of using portable fire extinguishers to the employees there. Eventually, because of strict, uh, stringent fire safety laws by the Illinois legislature, they passed a sprinkler law for wood frame buildings, which put, out, put them out of business. They had to have automatic sprinklers. The city ended up with two one-story masonry construction nursing homes, Americana off of Kennedy, which changed the name two or three times since then, and Casper's Nursing Home at Oak Street and Harrison Avenue. Besides daily inspections, we began several other fire prevention activities. Each year in October, the Bureau during Fire Prevention Week had a coloring contest with the cooperation of the Daily Journal and the Keiki Area Chamber of Commerce. A committee of five firefighters reviewed the 2,000 entries in the Daily Journal reading area for the coloring contest age four to 10. Sorry to say that three of those pictures are deceased. The man standing on the left, Francis McBroom, uh, Ken Markle sitting, and Paul Billadu on the far right. In December 1966, my little French Polish now, my Polish now, my twins, the other one over there. The face is of cellulose composition. The best to describe it is back in the silent movie times, the film was not fireproof or fire resistant. It just exploded up. And this is what the the face of this Polish doll is made of. Then they have a rayon synthetic hair. And the dolls are all stuffed with sawdust inside. A warning came from the state fire marshal's office how flammable these dolls were. The Kanky Daily Journal read an article in the paper and their switchboard lit up, receiving calls what to do, and they referred, the general referred the calls to the fire department. The chief, yours truly, and assistant inspector Al May went to approximately 15 stores where the dolls were found. This is long before Kmart, Walmart, or Target. We had Woolworks and Kresge's and McCullen's and so on. Well, we had Sears, Petty's, and Carson were still around. We asked the store managers to remove them the dolls for the safety of the children. We received 100% cooperation. An actual demonstration, which is showing there, Mark Fort set one of these on fire for the journal. It was completely consumed in four seconds. That's how flammable it was. The Federal Food and Drug Administration requested the British importer to recall the dolls. Approximately 200 dolls were sold locally, and about 100 were removed, and I acquired two of them. On March 15, 1967, two years after Assistant Inspector Al May, he resigned to go back on a shift. He found his special work in meeting people and filling out forms, I guess wasn't his cup of tea, so to speak. On February 1968, Chief Markboard assigned Bill Foster to the Office of Fire Inspector. As a firefighter inspector, he didn't give him a rank of assistant. This Bill took the test for assistant fire inspector in 75 and passed, and he also so took the test uh, for fire inspector and passed that. He had 17 years at the Bureau. 
He was promoted to assistant chief in 87. He really enjoyed bureau activities and he worked hard at it. Another fire prevention PR thing we could say, we distributed placemats with fire safety tips to all Kiki restaurants. We acquired four sponsors who paid for, for 10,000 three-color placemats when they were distributed during Fire Prevention Week in the restaurants in October. We acquired four new sponsors to print another 10,000 flyers for home fire safety. They were distributed to all KK City grocery stores for bag stuffers, grocery bag stuffers. We had a fire file, M, file, Amberg file land index factory on the east side of Kankakee off of Osborne Avenue. They printed up several hundred semi-waterproof cardboard posters with various fire safety logans to be posted on the fire hydrants in high traffic areas. That was their thank you for the Bureau training their fire brigade. And they were pretty, pretty wet at first. On the left, you know, there's uh, Lieutenant Gerald Markham on the left and Bill Foster on the right. We began training all hospital personnel, school custodians, kitchen personnel, industrial fire brigades, America Marietta, the name at the time, General Mills, General Foods, Armor Pharmaceutical, Armor Cork, Armstrong Cork, and extinguishing control fires with equipment available in their building. Portable fire extinguishers, an inch or inch and a half line, lines. This is, a, I can't tell you, it's one of the hospitals at Riverside or St. Mary's at the time. And these are uh, uh, school district cooks, I believe on the, on the top one, and more industrial fire brigades on the lower part. Get them used to handling their, the equipment that was available in their own premises. As Joe Mayotte, I believe that's at Riverside there. This is an oxygen fire. We use a mannequin in one of the department stores and it was the old fashioned hookup, Judy. <laughs> and set it a thing through the nose and we set it on fire and how to, <clears throat> to put it out properly. There's some more nurses or hospital personnel extinguishing control fires with the, getting the use of the fire extinguisher, not so much they got the fire out, but how to work the fire extinguisher that was on our premises. There's Joe Mayot, and you're truly next to him. I think these are school personnel here, School District 111, the custodians and the kitchen help. You see all the extinguisher lined up there on the curb in there. We use a lot of them. Okay, the next slide is in 1967, the Bureau surveyed the city for dilapidated buildings, sheds, barns, and garages. Notices were given to the property owners to repair it or demolish it. Out of 40, we received cooperation of uh, 34. The rest was turned over to the city attorney for further action by his office. On April 27, 1967, the city annexed West Kankakee, giving the Bureau uh, additional 49 businesses and three factories to inspect. In 1975, the former state, Kankakee State Hospital, was annexed to the city, giving the Bureau more duties. <clears throat> For years, the city did not have a full-time building inspector. Plans were reviewed by the city engineer's office and permits were issued without any fire department input. Because there was no desire by former fire chiefs to review building plans. For one thing, 
And once a building permit was issued, that was it. There was no changes or additions to it. We found that out the hard way. Found a building needed to be sprinklered, got a permit, it would not change it. 1968, this gentleman now is deceased, a close friend of mine. The city hired Clarence Bud Campbell as the first full-time building inspector. We received wonderful cooperation from him about reviewing permits and building plans before the permit was issued. This is where we started getting buildings sprinkled, standpipes installed, alarm system, and other fire protection equipment, emergency lighting, as required by the city building and fire codes. Uh, the Bureau submitted an ordinance just to back this up. It, this was voluntarily by him doing this. We submitted an ordinance requiring the submitting of building plans and specifications remodeling to the Bureau. We wanted that inserted in case a new building inspector was appointed. And that happened. In our Bureau case, it did happen. So we had the ordinance to back it up. With the support from the Keiki Chamber of Commerce and Daily Journal, on December 1968, we passed an ordinance to adopt the National Underwriters Fire Codes, the NFPA, National Fire Protection Association Life Safety Code, that allowed the Bureau to issue permits for various high hazard businesses and many other things involving exits. It established limits within the city where large quantities of above ground storage of flammable liquids and LP gas may be stored. We prevented parking of tanker, flammable tanker trucks parking on empty city lots next to homes and businesses. And I won't go into detail, all that was covered in the ordinance. The Bureau investigated numerous fire, false fire alarms to schools and numerous bomb calls in the 60s and 70s. We had excellent cooperation with the local telephone company and were able to catch many of the subjects. Many were teenagers and younger. They were referred to their parents or to the police department, juvenile department. Uh, okay. The city had an outdated fire zone map of the downtown area. This which is, fire zone one is where you restrict no burning and requires more stringent type of construction. In 1973, the Bureau working with the building inspector updated the map to include six additional blocks, as you see in one, two, three, four, five, six on there to enlarge the fire zone one as the city expanded. So it required all steel and masonry construction and no outside burning. The limited open burning ordinance was written by the Bureau and adopted by the City Council on October 21st, 1965. It was a very hard sell to the Council. Burning hours were changed several times. Finally, it was agreed upon the burning hours will be between noon and 7 p.m. And this is what this is all about here is putting out these fires after seven o'clock. At the time, the city council resisted complete no burning uh, because of the extra cost of garbage pickup with 100% no burning. The residents were giving uh, a 30 day grace period with no tickets issued. The price of the ticket for the first offense was $2. <laughs> the second offense was $5. And the third offense was $10. The city was divided into three sections. 
And fire trucks patrolled the city alleys after seven o'clock, putting out fires, smoke or fires, whatever the case might be. After the 30 day grace period, we started issuing tickets. The first month, 275 tickets were issued. So they understood that we were going to be strict enforcement of this burning ordinance, and no burning after seven. A couple of years later, a citywide no burning ordinance was passed. During this time, Gracefield subdivision did not allow any burning at any time. One reason they had no alleys, and because I think the covenants agreement upon the purchase of property probably prevented it. Because of the extra activity under the Bureau, on March 1972, a third firefighter inspector, Joe Mayotte, was assigned to the Bureau. This is uh, Inspector Foster and Inspector Joe Mayotte. Uh, inspecting gasoline filling stations all through our area, installing stickers on the gas pumps, reminding customers no smoking and turning off the ignition. 1969 through 1973, the Bureau started emergency evacuation bus drills on all school buses. All school children would learn how to use the rear door, emergency exit. We had several training sessions with the school bus drivers so no students would be injured in the drill. It was explained to the students to leave their books, book sacks on the seat so both heads would be free to exit the back door. Smaller students, as you can see, needed assistance at the big drop off uh, from there and we <clears throat> asked if they could put the uh, Huskier boys in the rear seats. <laughs> I don't Do we have another slide on that one? That's the one there. Okay. That's the one. Yeah, that's a big drop there. And we did it in the safety of the school parking lot, the drills. As I mentioned earlier, the Bureau had many duties besides building inspections. That's what we can thank John Markport to keep replacing or adding additional personnel in the department. Because I got assigned to other duties besides inspections in some cases. The chief had a senior captain, Roger Ringy at the time, but he was also a shift commander. The department didn't have a full-time trading officer. That came much later. Each shift commander trained their own crews. The department had no secretary. There was no such rank as assistant chief at the time to assist them in the many projects involved. So he delegated several of these projects through the years to the Bureau which yours truly was involved. The city purchased its Edwards alarm, fire alarm, and sprinkler system, a receiving system. This is where the dispatching room was moved off the engine room floor and put in the old so-called day room. It was an enclosed area away from all the carbon monoxide fumes and the noise and everything for the dispatcher that was on the engine room floor. <clears throat> we met uh, with industry managers, local school boards, nursing homes, large department stores, and hospitals that have alarm systems. One thing is either a fire alarm system or a sprinkler to tie in to the fire department and to monitor it 24-7. That's Lieutenant Henry Duval on the right. That's for uh, monitoring for early fire and discovery. We received very good cooperation. As you can see, the board is almost filled up. We have to keep adding on. We got almost 40 tie-ins 
The cost was $100 to connect it to the fire station and $7.50 for monitoring fee. Another project was the security lockbox. <coughs> Man, that's heavy. Can you hold that up for you? That was, that's, I, just, I just played around. <laughs> I need a guy like him to hold it up. Now, you guys that are retired and the active duties, I'm not talking down to you when I go through this paragraph. But I want to explain this box to other people that are not their spouses or other guests that are here. We had a, a system where the industry and businesses would give us a key to their gate, their front door of their business. They didn't want us to you know, crash in and break in if there was no sign of fire or smoke. That keys were kept at number one pumper behind the captain's seat. Whew, keys jingling all over the place. Keys were changed or locks were changed and they didn't tell the fire department so the keys were useless. It became a mess so a company came into the city or this came aware of a lockbox by a private organization and we were sold on it. This lockbox uh, by industry or private part, this is made for a home, but <clears throat> this is usually installed, bolted out of the building. Sometimes they'd use a, a ladder to get up there so to get the keys out. But they'd, there's a special fire department key that will open this box. They open that box, then you put your, your house key or industry key or whatever building key you want to put in there and they lock it up with the one key that will open these, all these lock boxes. It saves a lot of expense, especially if it's a, maybe a sprinkler going off or a, a bad detector. You don't want to, it saves some crashing into the building in some cases. Uh, <clears throat> I understand the fire department are involved in installing these in homes and put them over your front door and you have to check with them what the if there's any cost to that but people that have incapacitated persons in your home and you have to go out or something they can call 911 well they don't have to break in your home they open this up and get in your home if you're gone Okay, this is going to show one shot of the Crescent City Fire. That was June 21st, 1970 on Father's Day. The fire chief, along with three or four other Kiki firefighters, went out to mutual aid. And he was seriously burnt, along with James West, who was burnt but not as serious as he was. The chief was so badly burnt, I visited him many times, covering with a, what do you call it, Judy? Special clothes to get on to see somebody. Anyway, so he wouldn't infect him. We didn't know for sure if he was going to survive. But after several months, he eventually returned to duty. Why am I talking about this? Well, the acting, or uh, the fire chief, Roger Riggi, was on a shift, had to work days because the chief was in the hospital, and he appointed yours truly as chairman of a fire coat committee to look into, investigate a better fire coat than a heavy black rubber coat that were available. 
We got to think uh, Captain Dottillo on the far left, and he's Zaritas, Peter Zaritas' dad. Uh, I think that's Larry Coleman, Dave St. John, and Dad Ward. Uh, <clears throat> We are able to acquire fire, five fire coats without any charge to test them by different manufacturers for heat and cold. There's a fire coat factory that had the Nomex, new Nomex material in Danville, Illinois. And we actually purchased our coats there. We became the first fire department locally around here to purchase the yellow Nomex coat with the Velcro closures instead of the hard aluminum belt snaps. And other this other so safety speech, uh, special features were in there. Later, the black Nomex coat became available and more popular. The purchase was done by each firefighter's clothing allotment. I think we have there, that's the completed <laughs> Nomex with the winter lighter in it. <coughs> The next subject I'm going to cover is the fire department communications. I requested the council to purchase a 24-hour recorder logger machine using the income for the fire, fire, fire alarm system we saw earlier. This is uh, Dick Wade, who's deceased, and so is John Markport standing up and yours truly there. Unit was installed in the dispatcher's room, which is what we saw earlier, the old day room. It recorded all incoming and outgoing phone and radio transmissions for fire equipment or paramedic squad. It recorded how much time it took you to get to the call, how long you stayed at the call, and the machine had an install replay if needed in case the original phone call was garbled and you had to replay it back. Now, recorder logger saved the fire department's reputation with accurate information many times where the person who took the emergency vehicle so long to arrive, the recorder indicated three to five minutes. Let me take a swig of water here. There was a guard who worked night shift at different factories during the week. He called in a fire at America Marietta on Fair Street. When the fire department arrived on Fair Street, there was no fire emergency there. He was working at Bungie on Route 50. He forgot where he was working that night. So we called the management of Bungie to come to the fire station the next morning to listen to the call, to let them know why we arrived a little bit late. Through the years, that voice recorder became a big assistance to the department in checking out false alarms and bombs calls. Another project is Fire Inspector Joe Mayette and the Building Inspector Bud Campbell concentrated their inspections to 54 licensed taverns and restaurants. They made their inspections 60 days prior to May 1st, when the licenses were due. Each building had at least one building or fire code violation. Inspections were, re-inspections were performed before May 1st. The report was given to the mayor as liquor commissioner that all had complied with all pre-existing violations. The program was a great success. <clears throat> At the beginning, members of the Bureau had so-called vibrating pagers, voice one way from the dispatcher. If you was out on an inspection or in your car, you had to go find a phone to talk to them. In the early, early days, fellas. <laughs> now looking at the active duty guys when I said that. The other slide here is the Bureau became involved in training hospital and nursing home personnel about evacuation procedures. 
This involved training him the seven standard carries of removing a patient from a room. All seven are not here. You got the one chair carry, a round the hip carry, and a two person chair carry here. And you got a two person lift carry here. And we even have a carry where he put the blanket on the floor, get the patient on the floor and pull the blanket out, uh, out of the room. Strictly a one room, whoops, somebody grabbing me by the legs there. <laughs> I cleaned it up. <laughs> okay, through the years, the Bureau conducted hundreds of educational fire safety programs to clubs and organizations and general public. <clears throat> I see we have one of the things we use here, the dust explosion chamber down there. We had the gasoline vapor box and the aerosol hairspray danger around open flames and we had the Dalla House that was made specially for the Bureau, which could set off 16 fires electrically in different rooms, showing smoking in bed or food left on a, unattended on a stove and etc. The next slide kind of covers the expansion of the Bureau's activities. On the far left side, it's got building inspections. Next is investigations of fire, arson, fault alarms, gas orders, mob calls, and complaints. Our training programs, what we just talked about, bus drills and hospital industrial. In other duties, we did fight fires and reviewed building permits and special fire prevention projects and so on. <coughs> I'm going to discuss two arson hotel fires and then a third one catching a person in the act of setting a fire, his seventh fire. We had a person who set six fires at night, between 6 and 10 o'clock at night for several weeks around the old Bear Brand, which is now known as Jewel Grocery Store, and the empty warehouse, which was formerly Sully's Restaurant, was across the, across the street at East Avenue, or West Avenue, and Brabonis. On November 1st, 1963, after weeks of stakeout by members of the Bureau, the fire chief, and several off-duty firemen, including Tom McVeigh, uh, we staked out the place in our cars. The chief went into, got Ray Nury's coal office, got the key and he staked out in there, a little bitty shed across from the warehouse. We finally caught the man setting the fire. We let him set it. It was an empty warehouse. Young man right there, Age 24 at the time, he's probably 74 now, <laughs> if he's living. Terrence Frigo, he, after he set the fire, he started to make a run for it towards Washington Avenue. Robert Schultz, another off-duty firefighter, and I, working together, caught him running towards Washington Avenue. We sat him down in the curb. <clears throat> Mark were jumped out of the coal office building we had CB radios, what we had, to communicate with each other. And he started getting up and running again. He's about 10 years younger than I was at the time. I couldn't catch him. So I shouted to him, stop or I'll shoot. <laughs> and he said, no, no, stop, don't, he said. And then Mark Wood and I hit a bang, wrestled him to the ground and took him in over to City Hall. He didn't know if we were police or fire because we're all in civilian clothes. But actually, it's what I did. <laughs> anyway, we faked him out. He worked at General Foods on a day shift, got off at 3 o'clock. He wandered around downtown and he worked, he lived on the south side. 
He got his emotional kicks by setting fires. None of the fires really caused any damage in that empty warehouse. And he was placed on three years probation. He's probably 74 now, so. Our next fire is at the Hotel Lafayette, January 12, 1967. Lafayette Hotel was located 200 block South Schuyler, a four-story building with 88 rooms, occupied by 120 residents. A fire was set outside the door of a room 2404. The room was rented, but not occupied at that time. The person setting the fire returned to the main floor. The person operating the elevator, they were no automatic elevators then, they had a man or personnel. He discovered the fire up on the fourth floor. He took the elevator back to the first floor and told a person on the first floor there was a fire up there. He was a bellhop. The bellhop ran up four stairs and attempted to put the fire out with the small fire hose there. Fire burnt part of the door, door frame and carpet. About $140 damage in the, at that time. There's a young man there. In questioning Richard Dillinger, D-I-L-L-I-N-G-E-R, the bellhop, he was also a resident and an employee of the hotel. He mentioned newspapers were burning. In questioning other employees and residents who were witness to the fire, from their report, the fire was going so good that they could not possibly identify what was burning. So how do you know it was newspapers? So we suspected him right away as a, to interrogate him more. We asked him if he'd take a Bollycraft test the next morning. He said yes. Well, the next morning he arrived to tell us he had set the fire and didn't know why he did it. He pleaded guilty to criminal damage to property and he's received 90 days to the state farm. It's, uh, we felt set the fire, put it out, and be the hero, we assumed. Now this is the big fire left. Some of you guys might have been retirees were there. The Alamo Hotel, 200 blocks Southeast Avenue, was a three-story, stone-constructed, 43-room, 80-year-old structure. Prior to the fire on February 24, 1964, at 12.13 a.m., the fire department responded 12 times in the last six months for fire and emergency calls. During that same period, we were having meetings with the owner and attorneys in court over code violations. After one fire, Chief Marquardt stationed Andy Zaritas at the bottom of the stairwell to let no residents go upstairs. The owner's attorney acquired an injunction and then removed Andy Zaritas that same day. <clears throat> the 13th fire run was the last for the Alamo. Firefighters evacuated 15 guests down the rear fire escape and eight down the front stairway. The record keeping was very poor on the hotel register, you know, truck driver, Jake, Pete, no last names, no address, nothing. So we didn't know <clears throat> if we had any bodies up there or not. A complete search of the hotel found no bodies. Bodies were treated for smoke inhalation. It took several days to search the ruins for the cause of the fire. After interviewing uh, 15 employees and residents that came down to a disgruntled ex-dishwasher, after questioning them, it was 10 below zero that night of the fire at the rear fire escape 
of that hotel there. It would show the front one yet? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's the front, yeah. All righty. Name was, you got the picture of uh, Alfred Moss now? No, that was probably the first one, yeah. He was age 48. He'd probably be 103 if he's living at eight. <laughs> he admits setting a fire in the basement rear stairwell. He was an angry because he was paid $8 for seven days work after the owner deducted his room rent and his meals. He received six months sentence to Vandalia Prison in Danville. Four firefighters received awards for breakery at this fire. Now we're going to something else now. April 1967, the Bureau drew up an ordinance and was passed by the city council whereby two flammable tankers or LP trucks traveling in the same direction on West and East Court Street were to maintain at least two blocks apart from each other. These tanker trucks were on a state route, but they're passing by St. Mary's Hospital, downtown area, courthouse, post office, a school, and many business places. In 1958, a 4,000-gallon flammable tanker truck had an accident in West Kankakee in front of the Kankakee Foundry. It took on a whole block, including two homes, a gas station, and a whole front of the Foundry office. For six years, no city vehicle was provided to the Bureau. We used our personal cars fill it with gas once a month, and I was allowed to submit a voucher to the city for $25 a month for wear and tear. I made a lot of emergency runs, and I enjoyed it. I wasn't forced into it. I had a small rotating light on the roof and one on the dash. I rigged a lighting system for the headlights would alternate on and off. Scavengered a small siren. But that took the battery down real fast when <laughs> run that. And uh, the fire department got some new radios, and I got the motor oil representative to give me a second hand one off of one of the trucks to put in my car. <clears throat> okay, in 1967, I used Green Chevrolet, as I was told by somebody in authority, <laughs> Lauren Skeldon. It was donated to the Bureau. I don't have a before picture. Wish I had it. It was an all green, dark green four door. It was donated to the Bureau by the nursing home in Aroma Park, which was under contract for fire service with the Kankakee Fire Department. This was the administrator's way to show his appreciation to the Bureau in training his help in bed carries and evacuation. Bill Foster's brother, Bob Foster, did the paint job and the city did the lettering. The next one got another donation. This is a before picture. 1969, the Kankakee County Liquor Association donated a, a used van to the Bureau after uh, Bob Foster painted that. Uh, I'm waiting for the red one. There we go. <laughs> and uh, I have no particular reason why they donated. I don't know why, but it didn't slow down the inspections anyway. And so he turned over the keys, July 3rd, 1969. 1974, the city purchased a new van for the Bureau. It was factory painted like yellow. It was a thing going at the time. What is the best visible color for an emergency vehicle? Of course, it went over like a lead balloon, fellas. <laughs> the van was equipped with fire investigative tools, gas detectors, and evidence preservation kits. And winding down, I got one more page. <laughs> I like to, they're not here. 
I wish to acknowledge the four journal, daily journal reporters who covered City Hall beat, which included the fire department. They gave the fire department a lot of newspaper coverage and daily activities, plus answering fire calls. I'm gonna go back another step. When the emergency squad start, began as an emergency squad, the journal named the, the actual men that were on the squad and named the patient that was in the squad. I don't know if they're hard up for news, but in the 60s, they mentioned the names that were actually manning the squad. Now you don't hear anything. <clears throat> anyway, the names are Ed Mundy, Rick Davis, Jan Gladwell, and the local reporter is still around, is Jerry Morgan. Many of the PowerPoint pictures came from the Daily Journal newspaper clippings. I'm proud to say during the years in the Bureau, there was no loss of life in the public or assembly buildings in Kankakee. I may add, I believe that is still true to this day. I look forward to coming to work every day. I retired after four years as Assistant Fire Chief under Fire Chief Roger Riggie. Wife and I wanted to travel with a RV vehicle hooked up behind a 454 76 Pontiac. <laughs> In closing the presentation, I wish to name 16 firefighters and officers who were, were in the Bureau the last, thick, last 50 years. Bill Foster was the last fire inspector. In reality, there were only two of them. I believe there's no longer an ordinance on the books for fire inspector. Changes were made whereby a captain or lieutenant were in charge of the bureau. Now the list of names were given to me by several sources who were in the bureau after I retired. They're not in chronological order or who followed each other. If I miss someone, you can call my attention. Yours truly is the first fire inspector, Inspector Bill Foster, who later became Assistant Chief. Al May, Assistant Fire Inspector, later became Fire Chief. Fire, Fighter Joe Mayotte, promoted to Lieutenant and Captain. Gerald Markham, Firefighter, promoted to Lieutenant. Captain Tom Hayward, Lieutenant Rich Lambert. Uh, James Dupree, part-time, and became Chief. I think Dale Allen, you're here. Robert Gessner, uh, Captain Dave St. John, who later became Fire Chief. Terry Lewis is here, became Assistant Fire Chief and Acting Fire Chief. Captain Bob Leringer, Firefighter Don Fordall, and Captain Dave Harmon, who later became Assistant Fire Chief. Captain Ron Young became Fire Chief. Captain Mike Casagrande and firefighter Guy Mazenev. Now working in the Fire Prevention Bureau was not a handicap from being promoted. Out of 18 members, 18 were promoted to higher ranks. And that concludes my presentation for this afternoon. Any questions? That's it. <laughs>